The idea of going to sea for pleasure is relatively new. The first luxury cruise boat was built in 1833. It was built in Italy and it was christened Francisco I. But it wasn't available to the general public. You had to be a member of the European royalty, or very rich, or very famous. But once you got on, you had a great time. They had excellent food, private parties, gambling, and escorted tours on shore. The first company to truly enter the cruise business was the Peninsular and Oriental Steam Navigation Company. In 1844, it offered a luxury cruise service from England to Gibraltar, Malta, and Athens. During the second half of the 1800s, the business took off. They built bigger and more luxurious ships and added cruises to Egypt and Turkey. During the first half of the 20th century, the idea of luxury cruising was catching on. But it was the 1970s television series Love Boat that truly popularized the idea. As part of a series of fundraising projects for our PBS stations, I have hosted over 30 European river cruises. From Amsterdam to Basel on the Rhine, from Paris to Normandy on the Seine, from Regensburg to Budapest on the Danube, from Arles to Lyon on the Rhone, from winery to winery on the Loire, along the Douro in Portugal, and thousands of PBS viewers have traveled with me. Sadly, I have run out of European rivers to cruise on. Accordingly, I'm going to sea to see what I could see. The Baltic Sea is in northern Europe. Its northern shores touch the coasts of Sweden and Finland. To the south is Denmark, Germany, and Poland. My cruise started in Portsmouth, England, just down the road from London. Portsmouth has an extraordinary naval history. It has the world's oldest dry docks. It's where Lord Nelson built his flagship for the Battle of Trafalgar. Charles Dickens, the author of Oliver Twist, lived in Portsmouth. So did Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote the Sherlock Holmes stories. It didn't put handcuffs on Colonel Moran, so I had to do it myself. Inspector McDonald during the fight was more hindrance than help, which is not characteristic of a real policeman. Amazing, Holmes. I'm covering such a fiendish spot with so little evidence. And Arnold Schwarzenegger trained here. And it was the birthplace of Peter Sellers. Does your dear go back? No. Oh. Oh. Yes, dear get. Oh. I thought you said your dog did not bite. That is not my talk. Our first stop was Zeebrugge, which is a port on the coast of Belgium. People have been living in the neighborhood for over 5,000 years. It's a primary seaport with lots of commercial traffic. Just inland from the port is the city of Bruges. During the 1100s, Bruges developed some of the earliest forms of commercial capitalism and became one of the world's most important commercial centers. They used bills of exchange, letters of credit, and promissory notes. In 1309, they opened what was probably the world's first stock exchange. They welcomed foreign traders dealing in everything from cloth to spices. They set up economic colonies in England and Scotland. The first book printed in English was printed in Bruges by William Caxton. And as you might expect, these days you can download many of Caxton's books from the Internet. The top attractions are the Museum of Classical Flemish Art, the Town Market, the Belfry, the Church of Our Lady, the Basilica of the Holy Blood, and the Provincial Palace. The ship I'm sailing on is the Crystal Symphony, and it spent the next day cruising the North Sea. 
a perfect opportunity for me to point out how much of the original approach to cruising has remained in place. Of all of the comforts associated with luxurious ocean cruising, the most important were always eating and drinking, and drinking, and drinking. The early liners had dining rooms with long tables and swivel chairs that were bolted to the floor. By the early 20s, there were splendid dining salons with freestanding chairs and an extraordinary staircase that gave guests the opportunity to make a grand entrance. Its grand foyer and main dining hall rival the decorated splendor of a palace. In the early 1920s, many of the ships recreated the famous dining rooms from Europe's chic hotels. And what do we have today? Same thing. They reproduced Nobo's Silk Road restaurant. Nobu was born in 1949 in Japan. When he graduated high school, he went to work in a Tokyo restaurant. At one point, a customer who was a Peruvian of Japanese descent invited him to come to Peru and open a restaurant, which the customer offered to fund. So Nobu moved to Peru. However, when he got there, he couldn't find most of the ingredients that were available to him in Japan. As a result, he had to start improvising, which led to his unique style. It incorporates Peruvian ingredients into traditional Japanese recipes. And the restaurant here on the ship recreates his style. A hundred years later, and first-class cruise ships are still recreating famous restaurants. The more things change, the more they are the same. As a journalist, my first response to almost everything I am told when I am working on a story is, yeah, prove it. So when I heard there was a restaurant on the ship developed by Piero Salvaglio that offered authentic Italian food, I decided to stop by and challenge the claim. Salvaggio is a big deal restaurateur in Los Angeles. The restaurant is called Prego, and the menu offers traditional Italian dishes. I was surprised. Good stuff. Food has always had the ability to be more than just nourishment for the body. Food can be a symbol of wealth and power. It can be a source of emotional comfort. It can be a distraction or an entertainment. And there is a considerable amount of scientific evidence that eating reduces emotional stress. From the beginning, the great ocean liners used food and wine for all of the above. Ah, breakfast. My ma said it was the most important meal of the day. My favorite gastronomic experience aboard the ship was the ice cream bar. They have three or four different suppliers. They have soft ice cream, they have frozen yogurt, they have regular ice cream, but most importantly, they have Ben and & Jerry's. Now, I live in Switzerland, and Ben & Jerry's ice cream is imported to Switzerland, but only the four most boring flavors you can imagine. And for years, I've tried to get them to bring in Cherry Garcia but apparently the idea of the Grateful Dead is offensive. Our next port of call was Copenhagen, which is the capital of Denmark and home to the oldest monarchy in Europe. We visited the Tivoli Gardens amusement park and were greatly amused. Lots of interesting museums, including one dedicated to the Floridanica dinner service. The Danish king, Christian VII, ordered it in 1790 as a gift for Catherine the Great of Russia. But Catherine died before the stuff was ready, so the Danish royal family kept it for themselves. Today it belongs to the present queen. Copenhagen also has some top restaurants, including a few that are considered the best in Europe. And there's an extensive area for shopping.
Our next port of call was Berlin. Berlin was the crossroad for two ancient trade routes when it was officially founded as a city in 1237. During the 1600s, Louis XIV decided that Protestants were no longer wanted in France. But they were definitely welcomed in Berlin. By 1700, approximately 30% of Berlin's residents were French Protestants. The city also welcomed immigrants from Bohemia, Poland, and Salzburg. In 1740, Frederick II, also known as Frederick the Great, came to power. Under his rule, Berlin became a center for the Enlightenment. At the core of the movement was the idea that reason was the primary source of authority. In advanced ideas like liberty, tolerance, constitutional government, and separation of church and state. During the 1800s, the Industrial Revolution transformed Berlin. The city's economy and population expanded and it became the main railway hub and economic center of Germany. It became the capital of the German Empire. In the early 20th century, Berlin was a creative center for architects, artists, and filmmakers. It was a time of sustained economic prosperity with a tendency to promote whatever was new and modern. It was a city on par with New York, Paris, and London. It was known for its leadership in science, technology, and the arts. It was where Einstein rose to public prominence and in 1921 won the Nobel Prize for Physics. The film Cabaret presented a fairly accurate picture of Berlin at the time. This was Germany in the early 30s. Hello, stranger. Full of life and love. These days, the city is back as the capital of a unified Germany, and it has a population of approximately three and a half million people, which makes it the most populous city in Europe. Hands down, my favorite spot to visit in Berlin are the food halls at KDW. KDW is Europe's largest department store, and its food halls offer 34,000 different things to eat and drink. There are lunch counters throughout the halls, so you can taste whatever interests you. I also get a kick out of the Assisi Panorama, a 50-foot-high steel rotunda that tries to recreate Berlin on a fictitious fall day in the 1980s. The exhibit features audio sequences, video, and photography documenting the time period. You can step into the panorama, which is an amazing lifelike true to scale painting, and feel what everyday life was like on both sides of the wall. The Tiergarten is often called Berlin's Central Park, and tucked away in the park is a cafe. It's a beer garden with traditional German food and drinks, and an amazing view of the park. Next day, we were cruising the Baltic, which gave me time to continue comparing the past with the present. By the early 20s, exercise had become an important part of the experience. There was a promenade deck for long walks, a fully equipped gym. Some ships had squash courts, steam baths, and saunas. One vessel actually had a tennis court and the game of miniature golf was invented for ocean liners. During the 1930s, ocean liners introduced the Lido deck with a swimming pool. And today, not much has changed. On the cruise ships of the late 1800s and early 20th century, you might have a library. This is the ship's library. The sign says they have 2,000 books. 
Now they have 2001. Passengers were mostly left to entertain themselves. But these days, entertainment is a central element on a cruise ship. There was a cabaret-style production, a theater showing recent movies and classics, and of course, a casino. Now I should point out that I have absolutely no skill when it comes to casino gambling, but I thought I should mm, at least give it a try. And the management was kind enough to give me a private lesson. Now, in order to play the game, of course, somebody has to bet. Imagine that. Somebody has to put money on the table. Great. Um, I want to just talk to my cameraman for a minute. Can I have the five bucks, please? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Bert, I'll tell you what. Oh, Bert, uh, so, so my other pants. <laughs> Just because I'm such a nice guy, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and spot you, and I'm going to show you with our money how to play the game. Okay. All right, now the most common way to bet on this is to bet the ante and the pair plus. And what that means is you're going to go ahead and look at your hand. This one. Sure, go ahead, pick it up, take a look at it. Now, the rule of thumb is if you have a queen 10 or better, you would stay in on the hand. Okay. Let's see what you got. I just put it down, show well, everybody? Generally, you don't show everybody. They want to keep the cards of yourself, but for the sake of doing this, you have a very good hand. You have three cards in sequence or in suit. This see is a little white box here. You yeah. just take your cards, you put them face down. Mm. In order for me to qualify, if I, I have a queen or better, plays as normal. What we do yeah. is we refund this. That's still a live bet. That's just You're a natural at this. You just won. You, Where did I win? You have half your cruise paid for. You're going to win even money on those. And remember, the flush on the pair plus pays four to one. So I'm going to give you four to one. I'm going to take your cards. And you're a happy camper now. So now we go to the next player. Yeah. I think I'm going to be in remedial poker. <laughs> And then there are the areas of self-help and self-improvement. The central idea is always the same. How do I make myself better? In 1841, Ralph Waldo Emerson published an essay entitled Compensation. It suggested that every man and woman needed to thank his or her faults and learn the techniques of self-help. During the middle of the 1800s, self-help books became bestsellers. The central theme was Heaven Helps Those Who Help Themselves. In the final decade of the 20th century, self-help books became the most successful section in many bookstores. There was Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success, Seven Tips to Achieve Great Wealth, and my personal favorite, The Seven Keys to Writing a Best-Selling Book About Acquiring Untold Wealth, a Magnificent Social Life, Losing 25 Pounds in Just 10 Days, and Finding Bliss. On a more realistic level, contemporary ships offer things like dance classes, cooking classes, exercise classes. They have talks by scientists and journalists. There are classes on editing photographs, website design, and how to get the most from your smartphone. There's a team of experts who will help you understand how your devices work and which devices will work best for you. While I was trying to comprehend the complex technology of my iPhone, the ship visited three additional ports. About 13,000 years ago, the last ice age came to an end, and as soon as the ice melted on the eastern shore of what is now the Baltic Sea, the first Estonians moved into the neighborhood. Of course, at the time, they didn't know they were Estonians, but that wasn't important. These days, Estonia is one of the most highly developed countries in Europe. It ranks high in economic freedom, 
civil liberties, education, and a free press. Its citizens have universal health care, free education, and the longest paid maternity leave in Europe. It also has one of the most digitally advanced societies. It was the first nation to hold elections over the Internet. Tallinn is the capital of Estonia. The center of the city is filled with cobblestone streets, churches, and buildings that date to the 13th century. Next was St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg is considered to be the most westernized of Russian cities and the cultural and creative capital of the nation. It has 221 museums, 2,000 libraries, more than 80 theaters, 100 concert organizations, 45 galleries and exhibition halls, 62 cinemas, and it is the home of the International Association of Computer Hackers. The final stop on our itinerary was Stockholm. During the 1960s, I worked in Stockholm for the Bonnier Publishing Company. It was a great town then, and it still is. Stockholm was built on a group of 14 islands that are connected by a series of bridges, which makes the place walkable and bikeable. Lots of excellent museums, world-class restaurants and cafes, and almost everyone you meet will speak English. The Royal Palace is the official residence of the Swedish monarchy, the offices of the king, and the other members of the Swedish royal family. In addition, it houses the offices of the Royal Court of Sweden. It is one of the largest royal palaces in Europe, with 1,430 rooms. The palace is open to the public, which includes entrance to five museums. My favorite museum is the Vasa Museum, which studies the sunken warship Vasa through a series of interactive exhibitions, films, and historical recreations. That's a quick look at the history of luxury ocean cruising. For Travels and Traditions, I'm Bert Wolf. Ah, but wait, there's more. Whenever we edit one of our programs, we always end up with more good material than we can fit in. Interviews, stories, recipes. So we decided to put them on our website, BertWolf.com. Mm -hmm.